This morning we have a reading from the book of Luke, chapter 11. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. With which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? I don't tell jokes often, but I heard a great joke, so I'm going to tell you. Um, a family who had three young boys who were younger elementary age. Um, the boys went to their parents and said, can we please have a puppy? Please, can we have a dog? And, of course, Dad said, ask your mother. And Mom said... Well, if you promise to take good care of the dog and uh, you feed him morning, you know, and night, and you take him for walks and you love him and you brush him uh, and you give him all the attention he needs, then yes, you can have a, a puppy. Do you promise? They said, yes, Mom and Dad, yes, we promise, we promise, thank you so much. So they brought home a puppy. Maybe it was a puppy like Jedi, I'm not sure. But it was a puppy, and they didn't name their puppy like Gabe did Jedi, they named their puppy Danny. Danny, like old Danny boy, whatever, Danny. So they were interested in first in you know, taking care of Danny, but you can kind of imagine what happened. They kind of started slacking off, and Mom was doing more and more and more care. And mom had told them, if you don't take care of Danny, then Danny has to go away from our home. Danny has to go somewhere else. Well, they were just not taking care of Danny. So one day, mom was, had just had it. And she walked into the uh, family room where the boys were sitting on the couch watching TV. And she said, boys, I have had it. You're not taking care of Danny. I have been taking care of Danny. I told you there would be consequences. Danny has to go. And the boys really didn't look up from the TV. They just went, okay, Mom. She looked and she thought, I don't think they were listening to me. So she turned off the TV set and she said, boys, I just told you that Danny's going to have to go because you didn't take care of him. They burst into tears. Oh, no, Mom, no, not Danny. We thought you said Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Dad. <laughs> not Danny. Daddy? Oh. Um, anyway, thank you for bearing. 
that joke with me. You all are just saints. Well, the parable, let me get back to the gospel. The parable of the um, friend at midnight that Amy read earlier is one of, uh, there are two other parables that, that Jesus tells in the gospel of Luke that don't appear in, in any of the other gospels. And that is the story of the friend at midnight, um, the story of the prodigal son, and the story of the good Samaritan. Um, those stories are unique to Luke's gospel. Okay, let's see. It worked. I'm, I'm playing with my new toy. Before that parable, oh, I told Becky this was going to happen. <laughs> no, I said, I, Becky, I'm technologically checked. She said, oh, Pastor Kathy, it'll be a piece of cake. I knew it wasn't. Here we go. Well, before, thank you all, thank you. Before the parable comes the Lord's Prayer, which emphasizes Jesus' close and prayerful relationship with God, envisioned as father, as daddy, uh, papa. And then after the parable comes an exhortation to persevere in prayer. So Jesus is, tells the parable, um, and then he says, and to follow up this story, I just want to tell you, you have to um, really practice prayer. And, and practice asking God, um, practice spending time with God. Don't give up easily. Just like the neighbor knocking at the door didn't give up easily, you don't give up easily when you're praying. How many of you have one of those new doorbells that, take, that you can see has a camera in it? And you can see who's at the door. Does anybody have one of those? Oh, I'm kind of glad. <laughs> I'm not the only one. I've heard, you know, they're really nice. You can see who's at the door. You don't have to go to the door um, to see who's at the door. You can see it on your phone or um, in another way. And so you don't have to answer the, the door if you don't choose to. You can see who's there and decide in advance. Now, in first century Palestine, where this story of the... Um, the neighbor asking for bread is set, you couldn't get away with not answering the door. That would not have been okay. That would have been extremely outlandish. You couldn't grumble and say, oh, I don't, I don't have time for you. Um, you couldn't say, my neighbor's standing at, the, at my door at midnight and I don't want to give him any bread, so I'm just going back to sleep. Because Villages, homes were close together, and people usually baked at a common hearth or at a common oven. So if Nancy had baked her bread earlier today, I would have known it because I would have seen her or I might have been out there. And if Jessica had baked her bread yesterday, you know, I probably would have seen that happening. So I would have known who had baked bread recently who might have some extra. And... So I would have known you had that fresh bread, and I would have gone to their home at midnight and knocked on the door if I didn't have any. And I would have expected that Nancy or Jessica would have answered the door and said, Sugar, Kathy, you can, I have some bread for you. The, the story of the, um, the neighbor saying, No, I'm, I'm busy, I'm asleep, I'm tired, and I'm, my children are asleep, go away really w wouldn't have happened this way. And that's why Jesus told it this way, to get their attention, to make them pay attention to the story. It would have brought shame on a village if a neighbor did not answer their door. Chuck, would you answer the door at midnight if I came to you and said, Chuck, I had some people come over, I don't have any food, will you give me a loaf of bread? If I bothered you at midnight, would you answer the door? 
If I knew it was you. Oh, <laughs> dry answer. I'll pay you later. <laughs> but in, 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 this, in these little villages, you couldn't do that. You would have brought so much shame on your village. Other villages would have talked about you. Do you know that in Sheboygan Falls, they don't come down to the door when somebody needs bread at midnight? Shame on them. We people in Plymouth are so much better. <laughs> okay, we people in Sheboygan, we people in Lomira, I'll, I'll, I'll share it around. So, villages were known for gracious hospitality and they did not want to be shamed by other villages. Well, how does all that tie into Father's Day? Well, today is Father's Day, and for those of us whose fathers are loving, and with whom we've had a loving and nurturing relationship, it's a day that we might stand on our father, father's doorstep and offer him thanks and gratefulness. And how do you thank a good father, a loving father, uh, who's still living? Well, you might give him a card, take him to the blind horse, Gary. Um, you might give him an invitation, you know, to, to go on a, a, a nice day trip somewhere. Did you, do you know what the three top Father's Day gifts are this year? Can you guess? Anybody throw out a guess? Come on. Coffee. Uh, <laughs> from this church, yes. From, from in the United States, the three top gifts are a cordless drill, a Weber grill, or a hobby tie. What's a hobby tie? Does it have like people's hobbies on it, like cordless grills or Weber grills? Cordless? <laughs> What's that one got on it? Plants and stuff. Okay, so it's got like a theme, a special theme. Okay. Did you get that? The theme from Rocky. My son's gave me last year. For Father's Day? Yeah. Okay, so see, you're just kind of ordinary in the statistics there, Chuck. Um, well, fathers are special. If we had fathers who are loved, were loving and nurturing, not all of us did. And we, we need to acknowledge that. Um, not all of us had good experiences with fathers or father figures. I was blessed to have a wonderful dad. Uh, he was born and raised on the coast of South Carolina, had a wonderful southern drawl, kept a full head of blonde hair until the day he died at 84, um, was in the Army uh, in the World War II as a joined when he was 15, was in the infantry, later became a helicopter pilot, and um, where he met my mom. My dad was a teacher and a principal, and one thing that he was very important to him and the way he showed his love to us was to take my sister and myself and my mom camping every summer. And as a teacher, he had extra time off that not other dads have. And one time, we took a six-week trip to Alaska in our pickup truck and camper on the back of the pickup truck, and we drove the 1,500 mile, unpaved, gravel road through Alaska up to um, Anchorage and, and back. It was a great trip. And on all those trips, we went to every state that we could drive to, uh, not that trip, but over different summers. I learned so much about history and geography and um, about my bad sense of humor, like when he took when my sister and I were on a huge, tall, not teeter totter, but what do you call the uneven, like, you know, you go up and down, seesaw, seesaw. And I was on the way up end. We were in a state park camping in Washington State. So we were coming back from Alaska. And I'm as, I feel like I was up all that way up there. I'm sure I wasn't. But my dad comes up to me, he and my mom go on her walk. And he has this giant, like, shell of a, like a cicada or a, a beetle, I don't know what, huge, on his nose. Yeah. It would, you know, the, the shell that the, the, that bug had let go of. And he had it on his nose, and he came right up to me. 
Dad, oh my goodness, I was scared to death. He thought it was so funny. But, and I love my dad. Dad died in 2006 of leukemia. Um, very loving, and I remember him with lots of fondness and love. Clearly, I'm not a father, and I had not had the blessing of being a mother either. But I recognize a good father when I see him, and I know there are lots of good fathers out here. And from our parable, we learn about fathers that a good father, in terms of our parable, is someone you can count on to come out, come to the door, and offer you nourishment when you show up on his doorstep. A good father, as we learned from our parable, offers you an egg or a fish, not a scorpion, when you have a need. A good father is someone who still answers the phone, even when he has caller ID and he knows it's you. <laughs> he still answers the phone and offers you encouragement and wisdom and help. A good father, in Luke's view from the parable we read, is one um, from that parable, but also from the parable of the Good Samaritan and the parable of the prodigal son, is one who doesn't just wait inside the manor house for you to come crawling back home because you've messed up. But this father throws dignity to the wind and comes running and embraces you and is so happy to see you, even though you made so many mistakes. That father didn't hold it against you. A good father from the story of the Good Samaritan in the Gospel of Luke is the one who comes out to where you're lying in the ditch, beaten up by life, and picks you up and binds your wounds and loves you into healing. Jesus began the Lord's Prayer that he taught his disciples. Father, not because he, he wanted, not simply because he wanted um, his followers to equate God with their human fathers. Because we all know God knows too that human fathers, human fathers can hurt as well as heal. Jesus used the word called God, Abba, or Papa, or Father, because he wanted his followers to know that this God is an intimate God who loves you dearly, and he drew upon something that um, they would know, that they could connect with, and that was a parental relationship. Jesus knew that we can't fully comprehend who God is. So he gave them something to make that connection with. Think of that when you pray to God, think about God as a loving parent or a loving father figure that you know. And that would then help us to understand um, prayer and who God is for us. Now let's say, since none of us have door cams, that one day our doorbell rings and we don't look out the window to see who's at the door. We answer the door and who's standing there but God? And we say, uh, yes, God. And uh, God says, you know how um, last night you were about, oh, I'd say 12.03 a.m. this morning, you were worried and you were anxious and you prayed to me, and you asked me for help? Well, I was listening, God says. I wasn't sleeping, I was listening. And I remember that you called on me, just like that person in the story called on his neighbor asking for bread. You called out to me, and I clearly remember what you said next. You said, God, I need you. Come and be with me. I need some bread. I need some peace. I need some help. I need your guidance. 
So then God says, as we're standing at the door, thinking, oh my goodness, God is right there. God says to us, why do you look so surprised? Didn't you think I was going to come to the door? Well, here I am as promised. Are you going to let me in? Amen.